Turning now to the Iranian-Canadian Congress, ICC, uh, Mr. Tabazinejad, are you starting? Who's going to start? Yes, I, I will start. Okay. Good to see you again. Thank you. Good to see you, too. Um, so, hello, honorable members of the committee. Uh, my name is Puyan Tabasinejad. I'm the vice president of the Iranian-Canadian Congress. Uh, we're a Canadian um, advocacy organization whose uh, role, goal is to advocate on behalf of Iranian-Canadians um, who number around 300,000 in Canada. So, first of all, I wanted to thank you for inviting me here today to, as a representative of the Iranian-Canadian Congress. Um, so, uh, while our community faces many issues, um, issues that other immigrant communities also face, um, today I, I must unfortunately put these issues aside so that I can speak to you about something which I believe poses a grave threat not only to our community, but to the integrity of Canadian values themselves and the commensurability of those values with our policies as, uh, as government and as a country. You have, also, you have likely heard about the delayed Iranian applications campaign in the news. Iranian PR applicants uh, were stuck waiting for years for their permanent residency applications to be accepted, usually with no justification whatsoever. Prevented from finding employment and undertaking studies, these applicants and their families suffer tremendously during these months and years of waiting. The delayed PR campaign and the ICC discovered upon investigation of this issue that Iranian PR applicants are subject to systematic differential treatment by our immigration and security authorities. Merely because their nationality is Iranian, these individuals were subject to lengthy and opaque comprehensive security processes, delaying their applications by months and even years. We have traced this uh, de facto policy to existing in its current form and intensity to at least 2016. In addressing the issue, the Honorable Minister of Immigration and Refugees, Ahmed Hossein, uh, recently announced that Iranian PR applications times have been significantly re reduced, though they are still significantly longer than the average, around 10 months longer. Indeed, we are appreciative that the government has reduced these delays. Here we must also thank all, all of the representatives who championed this cause, specifically Jenny Kwan, who not only advocated passionately for this issue, but also handled the individual casework of these applicants, uh, Thomas Molker as well, Majid Johari, and Michelle Rempel, who sponsored a petition on this issue. However, what I'm here to tell you uh, today is that the fundamental problem of discrimination against Iranians because of their nationality in our immigration system persists, not only for PR applicants, but also visa and citizenship applications. According to data gathered by the delayed campaign, Iranian applicants are, st are still being tagged en masse for comprehensive security examination. The reduction in delays showcased by the minister seems to have been because Iranians are being fast-tracked through the comprehensive screening process and not because they were actually not being subject to them in the first place, which is the original root cause of the problem. Here I must, I must mention that we have indications that some government officials are referencing certain sections in IRPA or the Immigration and Refugee Protect Protection Act dealing with inadmissibility based on sanctions or human rights regulations and rationalizing this treatment of Iranians. However, and I must state this point very clearly, in no way does any section in IRPA is, is any section in IRPA applicable to a blanket policy against individuals of a certain nationality? Indeed, any treatment of a nationality in this way effectively constitutes systematic discrimination on the basis of nationality in the Canadian immigration system. It not only runs counter to fundamental Canadian values of equality, but may actually form a violation of the Charter, specifically those sections forbidding discrimination based on nationality. Now that I've spoken about this a little bit, we have the pleasure, I have the pleasure of also um, presenting with Matthew Yousefi. Uh, he's a representative of the delayed PR applications campaign and a PR application hims uh, applicant himself. We're still waiting for his application to go through. He will now speak about his first-hand experience with this issue. Matthew, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, very much, Puyana. Thank you, the Canadian, for giving me this opportunity. I only have three minutes, but I want to state that I'm an independent uh, individual here from the Iranian government and from any organization, including ICC, and they are representing our delayed Iranian applications. Other than that, I'm an electrical engineer with two master's degrees, one in telecommunications and another one in quantum optics from Canada, the, uh, the country that of my choice. Why did I choose Canada, you may ask? Because of its merits and its humanitarian values. During the last six years that I have been living in and working in Calgary, I have been contributed to this country's innovation and econ economic competitiveness. Today, I would like to talk about 
uh, the delayed Iranian applications, a campaign built by independent, educated, and talented Iranian Canadians who are advocating one of the most important Canadian values, to right to be treated equally under the law. Last year, hundreds of Iranian applicants living whether in Canada or Iran noticed that there were, there were extraordinary delays in processing their visa and PR applications. After a thorough analysis of publicly available governmental and self-extracted data, we were disappointed to learn that the root cause of these delays was being singled out because of our country of origin. These delays have huge impacts on our life. I mean negative impacts. Iranian applicants, and applicants many of them highly educated with graduate degrees in science and innovative fields, uh, were deprived of, of job opportunities, international conferences, investment opportunities, and family unification a source of tremendous mental anguish and pain. More importantly, we were held back from taking part in the growth of this beautiful country. Back in April, in a joint meeting with IRCC, Public Safety, our campaign, and ICC, uh, we were told that the security screenings conducted by the CBSA are the main reason for these delays. 293 days on average, as was announced in this very committee. In fact, according to the immigration data, Iranian applicants make up over 16% of the security screenings sent to CBSA. Just note that Iranians make up only 3.5% of recent immigrations in Canada. We have a reason to believe that Iranian applicants are sent for comprehensive security screenings after eligibility, criminality, and medical requirements are met. While Canadian immigration law states that the applicants must be handled in a case-by-case -case basis, Iranian applicants are consistently asked to submit additional documents in, this admiss in the admissibility stage, the same document that I have it here today. This suggests that we are singled out due to our nationality. This is a very definition of discrimination based on the country of origin. Here I should state my appreciation for the help of a representative from across the political spectrum. Honorable MP Kwan has discussed this issue in the House of Commons many times, and she has handled many, many of cases directly. Honorable MP Rampel has sponsored a new petition for us that has gathered about 2,000 signatures, and, I'm, uh, and I appreciate that I had a chance to work with both of them. And Honorable MP Hussein and Honorable MP Goodell have admitted the delays and have promised to resolve the issue. While there, has been, there have been improvements in reducing the average wait time in the past few months, for which we are very thankful, the root cause of this appalling issue is far from being resolved. I would like to invite all the members of this committee, regardless of their respective parties, to stand in, un stand in unity against discrimination to help us to resolve this issue for the remaining applicants, including myself, and to prevent this from happening in the future of Can uh, Canadian history. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and I would like to ask uh, Puyan uh, to talk about solutions. Thank you, Matthew. So um, the ICC I think has we five just, recommendations. We just have about one minute left. Sure. Yeah, it's it's short. So thank you, Matthew. The ICC has uh, has five recommendations to remedy this um, important issue. Uh, firstly, is to prioritize all the remaining um, uh, applications that are still in delay, um, so that these their files are processed as soon as possible. Uh, secondly, is to establish a visa application center in Iran to reduce the rates of comprehensive security screenings for outline applications for outline applicants. Uh, thirdly, to ensure private information which is being gathered by third parties on behalf of the Canadian government is not shared with other countries or third party agencies. Um, this, is, this is an issue that's very important to a lot of the applicants, especially in view of the, of the Muslim ban of the Trump administration. Um, fourthly, to adjust the delays towards the citizenship applications by adding the extended wait time of applicants to their citizenship waiting period. We believe that this is fair. Uh, lastly, um, and most importantly, to stop labeling Iranians as a security threat and to provide justification, justifications to the individuals themselves who are being sent for comprehensive security uh, examinations and transparency generally in terms of how uh, individuals are chosen to be sent towards comprehensive security examination. Thank you. <clears throat> Very good. I'm, with the committee's permission, I'm going to suggest we do five-minute round, so we can get through one round before 5.30. The other option is to stay 10 minutes late. Which would you prefer? Okay, let, let's do a five-minute round, then uh, Mr. Tabera for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much for, for the witnesses for being here. And uh, again, we apologize for, for um, we had the votes, and uh, I kind of came back as fast as we could. Um, I wanted to mention um, to the first uh, speaker, sorry, I don't have your name in front of me, um, Kate Hooper. Um, 
You mentioned about uh, softer skills and that we need to uh, look at that and, and examine that uh, in terms of migrants and uh, look at underrepresented groups. If you can elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, I know your testimony was uh, short in time, and I just wanted you to elaborate on those two things. Sure. Should I, should I speak now, or are we going around no, with the yeah, questions? Oh, um, so in terms of softer skills, um, what we what we understand is that um, beyond the sort of educational credentials that we usually think about when we're assessing immigrants, um, there are a number of different skill sets that are becoming more and more important for employers. So this is things like creative skills, um, cognitive skills, abstract thinking, problem solving, um, evaluating data, that kind of thing, um, and then the sort of social skills or interpersonal skills. And those are those are the skills that are likely to be hardest to automate. Um, but will also so will become more and more sort of valuable as we continue. Um, currently, there aren't that many ways in which um, Canada can assess that in its immigration system. Um, the U.S. Department of Labor has something called the ONET database. Um, this maps out the different types of skills across occupations, um, so it tracks those different um, skill sets across different occupations, and then you can even search for those particular skills across different occupations. So I could do a search, for example, for you know abstract thinking skills across different occupations. And so I think that's an interesting way in which um, we can start thinking about those different skill sets and thinking about how those skills are applicable across different occupations as we see this churn in different sectors. Um, so that might be um, one area in which you know, Canada could perhaps look to the example of the US in that regard and see how applicable it is to their um, selection policies. In terms of underrepresented groups, um, the reality is that um, immigration policy will be one part of responding to emerging skills needs, but the reality is that we'll also need to look at those groups that don't um, work in the labor market. So this could be stay-at-home mothers, this could be you know, older groups, this could be minority groups who tend to be traditionally underrepresented. So I think we need to look both at immigration policies, but also ways in which to provide people who may have been outside the workforce for a number of years to help re-enter the workforce. So whether as you know, immigrants that may be providing them with tailored language support or help with credential recognition, or it may just be you know, looking at bridging programs that can help, say, mothers who've been staying at home for a number of years re-enter the workforce and update their CVs and sort of you know, find new um, occupations that they can sort of bring their expertise to. Um, I've been a, a kind of an advocate about um uh, there's a, s a skilled shortage here of, of labor, especially in the skilled trades, and so uh, I've advocated for looking at the point system in which um, uh, eligible migrants uh, would want to come in. They're always looked at from, you know, if they have a undergraduate degree, masters, and etc., and, and they get certain points based on that. So I've always stressed for um, those soft skills, as you mentioned. Um, my next question will I'll be to... Um, if I have time, uh, to Mr. Uh, Tabasjian. Um, the committee heard a lot of testimonies from, refu um, from the continuous refugee f uh, flows around the world. Uh, it, reason being is because of the inability to broker priests around the world. Um, can you provide suggestions as to what the international community should be doing better to broker peace? So, so I mean, what the immigration, uh, what the international community, can, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, but um, uh, I mean, I would love to speak on this issue, but I was kind of informed that this, uh, that this would be about voluntary migration, and this is kind of specifically what we've prepared for, and kind of specifically on the issue of uh, the delays in the PR application case. Um, so in terms of getting into kind of, uh, this seems like almost a foreign policy question that I haven't uh, fully kind of, uh, no, no, no. that I wasn't expecting. That's understandable. Well, besides the, the five points that you mentioned that uh, the government should look at within Iran, is there anything else that you would, uh, you would want to add to um, the reasons for the delays and, um, as you I, mentioned? I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to give you no. time. Okay. I'm, I'm right. being quite totalitarian at this moment. No um, Mr. Wah. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and I want to thank our committee members. Um, we only have five minutes, so we'll try to be quick. I just want to say, Ms. Hooper, you've hit it right on the nail with the, uh, the labor market in this country. It is changing so quick right now 
that it is so hard to adapt. And uh, you mentioned Uber and B&Bs and everything like that. And yet these are the people coming into this country that certainly could offer these uh, jobs because uh, many Canadians don't want to work second or third jobs. So you've hit it right on the, the, the nail. You know, the pensions are going to change in this country. We know the labor market is going to get softer with uh, permanent jobs that have nice pensions, that have all the benefits. And yet when we bring these people in, we're not going, they are not going to have the same quality of life, I believe, and you may share that, that we have today in this country. Would you agree or not? I think in terms of um, the benefits and the protections, that's my primary concern when it comes to those new types of jobs that are emerging. You know, we're seeing a lot of growth in um, temporary work and in, you know, contract freelance work. And the reality is that the way in which many of our um, employer systems work is that these benefits are then provided through your employer. But if someone is working for multiple employers, um, you know, they may not be covered by things like disability insurance or health insurance. And so I think it's really looking at um, how our social um, security system is set up and making sure that people aren't falling through the cracks. And that's true for immigrant workers, but that's also true for younger people who tend to be disproportionately represented in these more informal types of work. And so I think that one of the questions looking forward is thinking about our welfare system, thinking about the sort of labor protections that are in place, thinking about our benefits and ensuring that they, you know, move in tandem with the developments in the labor market. And so we don't see this sort of bifurcation into permanent jobs that have all of these protections and this stability and then a growing number of people who are then left behind. One of the challenges that we've had in this country is when we do bring in immigrants and, and newcomers to settle in our communities to deal with some of the labor problems. And you mentioned it in schools. All of a sudden now, English as an additional language is a big issue in many communities in this country where school divisions uh, have to find resources not only uh, for the current school population, but now these newcomers coming in here and they're being stressed out because classrooms are now larger in size and they're having difficulty dealing with these immigrants who cannot speak English or French very well. And that is causing a big strain in uh, provincial authorities along with territory authorities in this country. Can you comment on that a little bit and how we can deal with that? I mean, I think that it goes to show the importance of investing in English as a second language training, both within schools, but also for adults. Um, and I think that one example that we can draw from the US is the way in which you know cities and states are able to share some of their expertise, especially when you're dealing with immigrant groups that you know may have a smaller um, number in Canada. So if you're welcoming new groups of people that they may have you know, a different background or they may speak different languages. Um, I think that encouraging that resource sharing, both from the federal government, but also among provinces and territories and among cities will be really helpful um, for sort of equipping teachers with the information they need to help children yeah. in those settings. I'm going to go to Monty because I think I just got a minute left. Um, and we've had the delays in our province of Saskatchewan for many Iranians uh, to get their permanent residence in Canada. So any advice? Uh, that you can give because you're sitting in Calgary and you, you know the problem very, very well. So, uh, and, and they're in our offices. I want to say this. They're in all of our offices, uh, all 338. You know, those that are here are in our office trying to get uh, information that right now is not available or very, very hard to get. Uh, so thank you for that question. Uh, as you know, there are thousands of Iranians across coast to coast to coast in Canada that are involved with this issue. And we believe that the main issue is caused by not profiling in a better, in a right way. Uh, by profiling, I mean uh, there is a security system that uh, we do appreciate the existence of that because we want to raise our children here and we're going to integrate to this country for sure. But at the same time, there should be indicators that find the right people to be sent for comprehensive security screenings versus regular screenings. Uh, when you send all of Iranians for comprehensive security screenings and the queue, that, the queue for that uh, uh, system to be processed is a long wait. 
going to take a long time. So the easiest way would be do a better profiling for all applicants across the board. It doesn't matter who, where they are from. I'm afraid I need to end you there. Sorry. Ms. Kwan. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and I thank the uh, witnesses for their presentations. Um, in the limited time that we have, um, I know that with the Iranian uh, applications, these are highly skilled, highly talented individuals who bring um, a lot to Canada in terms of our economy. Employers are looking for them. They want them, uh, especially in the high-tech sector uh, and the, uh, uh, in the new economy sector. So now, my understanding is that in some of these cases, the average processing time is about a year. Uh, and and um, the spreadsheet that I have in my office, uh, to which there are some 77 applications, they're over two years. Uh, is that the general experiences uh, from your community? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll answer, so, but maybe, maybe Mehdi is actually better at answering this. Go ahead, Mehdi. Uh, so the thing is, when you look at the processing time for Iranian applications and you look at all the streams, uh, there is no uh, evidence that coming from the from the government because they have not released any data. But we know that uh, based on the, the data that came from the government in 2015, uh, the, the processing the wait, uh, wait time for Iranians was 90 percent higher than other all over the board, and in 2017 was about 40 percent higher. Uh, so uh, again, we have self-extracted data that shows that. Uh, for instance, if for express entry the average time is six months, we are looking at six, 18 months. Or if for uh, PNP the average is 15 to 19 months, we are looking at somewhere between 27 to even 30 months. So yes, that's true that uh, across all, uh, even QS will use the same thing. So it ra rarely happens that we can get the application process in the, norm in the normal processing time. Yeah, um, we also uh, learn of a situation in the Paris office, for example, where um, at least 15 applications in the Paris office, uh, nine had gotten their security screening, uh, criminality screening, and medical checks successfully completed. Yet the applicant has not been notified, and their file is just somehow sitting there gathering dust uh, and not being known. And we asked IRCC, how could that possibly be? Because all the screening has been completed, but yet the applicant has been not been notified that they have been approved. Uh, in they're just still waiting and waiting and waiting. Uh, so I wonder if uh, any of you can shed some light uh, on that experience. I have a first-hand experience with that, that I'm working with, uh, like, because I'm representing this campaign. Uh, so I hear from them, and I have been talking to 15 of them that they, they actually applied in 2011 or 2012, and they have passed every single stage of the uh, immigration system. If you look at the IRPA, uh, inadmissibility, criminality, medical, and uh, eligibility, but basically no response from there, and the government is not releasing any data that why these applications are on hold. Right. And then you also often have a situation where, uh, when people inquire about it, the one word answer you get is unknown or pending. Is that correct? Uh, I personally have emailed uh, uh, the Minister of Public Safety, and the, the result that I got from that uh, ministry is that uh, the security uh, screenings are in process, and there is no timeline for that provided for you guys. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, that no it seems almost everybody is being sent towards a comp comprehensive security screening to begin with. That's the real problem. All Iranians based on their nationality. Sorry. I Could you just repeat the first part of that? We missed it. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. So what I'm what, what the problem that we've kind of identified is that Iranians have a much 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 higher chance than every than anyone else um, for being sent for comprehensive security examinations. Again, we don't have exact reasons as to why this is happening, but that is the root cause as far as we've identified it. So that's 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 what I would say, that that's what really needs to be looked at. We need to look at why these individuals are being tagged. We need to have greater transparency in the process, both for organizations like us from the outside looking in, but also that's, this information needs to be given to the applicants themselves. Why are they being sent towards comprehensive security screening? I mean, if, if that is, and if, if that is indeed happening, not just being told it's pending. Um, on this uh, on this issue, um, 
I think that the committee would benefit quite a lot if we can receive a submission from you uh, outlining the current situations, examples of situations uh, of the challenges people are faced with, and then, of course, the recommendations in going forward. I mean, I truly hope that we can actually find a way uh, forward for the government to address these issues because the Iranian applications, when you're stuck in the system like that, it truly is our loss. It's Canada's loss because um, the, the talent pool within the applicants is astounding. I mean, the vast majority of them have PhDs and double uh, graduate degrees. Uh, they're smarter than all of us put together and then some, and that's just one applicant. And so, um, so, so I just think that it's really important that we try and to figure this out. So any recommendations specifically on what the government can do to address that would be appreciated. Very, very quickly. De definitely. Um, um, so unfortunately, I actually wanted to apologize that we weren't able to give any submissions because we were only told about this um, in late Wednesday evening. Um, so that, that doesn't give us enough time to prepare and then submit in time for um, translation. We can definitely do that. Again, I outlined five um, uh, recommendations in my presentation. Um, it should, uh, I'll, I'll also provide that in writing and then we can also uh, come Thank up you. with a long recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Whalen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Ms. Hooper. Um, but I'm not going to focus my questions on um, the Iranian delegation or the, the folks for the uh, for the um, for the conference. Um, of course, most Canadians know that diplomatic relationships with uh, Iran broke down in uh, 2003 after the state-sanctioned murder of Mr. Kazima, photojournalist, and then, of course, um, Canada recalled its own ambassador again permanently in 2012. Are there other ways in which the Iranian uh, community, the immigrant population into Canada is having difficulty by the lack of an embassy in Tehran? And I direct that to you, Mr. Uh, Tabazinejad. So sorry, so the question was, is how what is, other, how is What other problems are, are, is your community facing as the result of a lack of an embassy in Tehran? Definitely. I mean, I actually received um, part of um, the delayed applicants um, issue as, as, being, as being related to this because, because we don't have an embassy in Iran, especially for outlined applic applicants, um, and we don't have a visa application center in, Euro in Iran either. And this is something that actually we made, uh, we made into a petition that was sponsored by um, MP, uh, MP Kwan. Um, but um, so that's, this is one way that, it, it, that it's likely affecting um, us. But I mean, it affects us in multiple ways. We, we have no access, you know, the Iranian community, unlike, any, unlike pretty much all immigrant communities in Canada, has no access to consular services. So if tomorrow I wanted to renew my Iranian passport, I, I wouldn't be able to do that in Canada. I would have to go through a lengthy and costly process and go through the United States. Well, would you agree becomes... then, would you agree then that it's this lack of of, um, of formal diplomatic ties between the countries that's really stemming the problem, not any human rights abuse being committed by Canada? I would say that it's, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, that our lack of relations has perhaps exacerbated this problem. Um, but, to, but really the onus right now, even putting the issue of diplomatic relations aside, um, definitely that needs to be solved. But the, the issue right now that, that's very urgent, and I mean, and our, and, our, and, our, and our organization is very clear that we support diplomatic relations. But the issue right now that's very urgent is figuring out what's happening. Why are these individuals being tagged? If it is related to diplomatic, uh, the lack of diplomatic ties, that needs to be addressed. But really this needs to be, this needs to be tagged because I believe that it's a violation of the Charter and, and of Canadian values. Well, and I hear that position, but I think you've also made some arguments against that in your previous statement. So when we look at the statement that was made by uh, Minister Hussein on the 17th of October, obviously there was a lot of other news on the, on the 17th of October besides, uh, besides this particular statement by the Minister, but you're aware about he, he provided some additional detail. You're aware of the statement? That the, the wait yeah, times... Yes, yeah. And yeah, so... We are... Mm. Go ahead. And so, uh, you know, is it reasonable? Uh, have they done well in reducing wait times by 20 months between 2015, where they hit their peak under the previous government of an extra 32 months down to now just an extra 10 months? It seems to me that they're really clearing the backlog. So um, I would, um, uh, firstly, I, I wouldn't characterize it necessarily as a backlog. So what's happening is that the vast majority of Iranian, Iranian or applicants are actually being sent into another stream. Uh, they, they clear everything else through IRCC, and they're being sent into the comprehensive security screening um, processes. Um, that said, yes, we do appreciate it. And I mentioned in my, in my presentation, we do appreciate that the delays have been reduced. But even, even in uh, Minister Hussain's um, uh, presentation in, in his statement, he mentions that we're still about 10 and a half months over overall Iranians are still and that's that's still an issue again 
Um, what we believe, our, our, um, our view of this, our prediction, again, it's difficult to say, our prediction is that what's happening is that the comprehensive security screening is actually being done faster, but the, the comprehensive, but Iranians are still being sent to, in, into comprehensive security screening at, at, a, at a rate far higher, far higher than anyone else. And, and I appreciate that uh, in uh, constituents from my riding, just as Mr. Wa and Mr. Soraya have uh, mentioned, we all have Iranians in our riding who are trying to become Canadian. Uh, they provide great service. They have great talents, uh, excellent at the universities, and we want their skills being put to work in the country. Um, but there's also other communities. So um, with, in, with respect to Turkish and other um, potential immigrants to Canada from the Middle East region and that region, uh, do you work at all with those other groups, or are they experiencing similar delays? Uh, to Iranians. From what I understand, Very briefly. Um, Iranians, it's, Iranians are singular in this issue. We're, we're the only ones facing this issue at this scale. And again, what I would recommend for the committee to do is to really ask and demand information about why this is happening. We need more information about why. We need, we need transparency in, into why Iranians are being sent into comprehensive security screening. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I would suggest we also get the information then on delays associated with Turkish, Syrian, uh, Iraqi, and other areas in the Middle East, because I have... And maybe Pakistani. Yeah, and just to see, because I think it's, it's really an issue about uh, where there's conflict in the world. It's not that Iranians are being singled out. It's just that Iranians love to come to Canada. We want them to come to Canada. I'm, I'm going to just put much. that on the record. We'll be requesting from IRCC a comparative analysis of that, just to double check. And we would commit uh, to the witnesses to try to understand uh, that better. Thank you very much for your, your, not only for today, but for your work generally. Um, we're uh, uh, always impressed with that, uh, the quality of civil society work on these issues. Uh